Well, welcome to this session on network services and major incidents. Unfortunately, we have had more than our fair share of major incidents this year. Manchester knows about that very well. So, what have we learned from them? Uh, we're going to hear from our panel. Uh, our panel is Chris Moran, National Clinical Director for Trauma, NHS England. Professor Huon Gray, National Clinical Director for Heart Disease, NHS England. Professor Keith Willett, Medical Director of Acute Care. And Tony Rudd, National Clinical Director for Stroke. I'm going to hand you over to our Chair, Keith. Thank you very much. So, welcome, and I hope this session you will find both informative and challenging. Because I think there are some things that we will talk about that we have done very well. We have a good evidence base, but yet we still often fail to deliver what our patients deserve. I have the responsibility as Medical Director Oversight in NHS England for the acute services, and I also have the Director role for Emergency Preparedness. But fortunately you're not going to hear too much from me because we have an excellent panel that's already been introduced to you. And we're going to start off by taking two areas which are key components of the Urgent Emergency Care Review. And for you to understand and think very carefully in your areas, perhaps why you haven't taken what is a strongly evidence-based program and delivered it to the satisfaction of your community. Both stroke and heart attack are areas that we have recognised there is indisputable evidence about improvement in outcome for our patients. And yet somehow, many of us in our localities, whether you are a commissioner, whether you are a provider, whether you're on the a &E Delivery Board or the CCG or in the STP, are somehow complicit in not delivering these services in a network way for our patients. We'll follow that with a presentation um, from Chris Moran, who has led all the debriefs for the major incidents that we've sadly had to deal with in the NHS in the last six months. So the two London and Manchester uh, terrorist incidents and Grenfell Tower. But it's interesting that we've seen almost no criticism of health or care or the NHS performance in those incidents. And therefore it's not unreasonable to say there's a network service, major trauma. It's established, it's countrywide, every patient is in a network and every patient had the opportunity to be networked to a major trauma centre if they needed it. And then there was no criticism. There perhaps isn't the same equivalent in stroke or heart attack, but the evidence is there that we should be providing that on a daily, if not an incident-based basis. There are some learnings to be taken from the major incidents, and Chris will allude to those, and I think you'll find that interesting and challenging, particularly for those of you who are in or run organisations. But we start off then, and I'm going to ask Huon uh, first, and then Tony, to talk about, very briefly, what is the evidence? Where do we fall short? And what do you need to do to leave this room to go back and ensure that you have the network services in place for heart attack and stroke? So, Huon, if you may. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks very much, Keith. And I'm going to uh, uh, try and tell a 20-year story in five minutes. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the, the field of heart attacks, there are two major types of heart attacks. Um, ST elevation heart attacks called STEMI and non-ST elevation uh, heart attacks. They both share the same pathophysiology, which is essentially uh, blood clots blocking coronary arteries. Uh, a STEMI heart attack, which is what I'm going to talk about for most of the five minutes, is complete blockage of one of the coronary arteries. Now, this uh, recognition of the importance of blood clots in coronary arteries, and you'll probably hear further about this from Tony about stroke, 
um, introduced the uh, concept of thrombolysis or clot-busting drugs, which was the main treatment for uh, ST elevation heart attacks for uh, a number of years. And time is muscle, because if uh, uh, a coronary artery is occluded uh, for any length of time, heart muscle begins to, uh, to die. Now, the National Service Framework for Coronary Heart Disease in 2000 set out standards for the delivery of thrombolysis. And actually, as a country, we were doing really very well and beginning to introduce thrombolysis delivered by the ambulance service at the patient's home. But uh, time moves on, and whilst we were developing really very uh, good thrombolysis services, actually the emerging evidence from clinical trials was that mechanical opening of the coronary arteries uh, by taking a patient directly to the catheter laboratory, um, introducing catheters, and then mechanically opening the artery, usually delivering a coronary stent into the affected area, produced better outcomes than thrombolysis. Now, that clearly has major practical implications for the uh, delivery of services, uh, de the delivery challenges to the ambulance services, to hospitals, and, and so forth. And so in 2008, the Department of Health commissioned a £1 million project, a feasibility project, to look to see whether uh, we could deliver uh, primary PCI, this mechanical opening of uh, coronary arteries, in a reasonable uh, uh, length of time to the whole population. Uh, and um, uh, National Infarct Angioplasty Project, as, as it was called, NIAP, uh, proved the feasibility of this, um, uh, of this service. And subsequently, NHS improvement, as it was in those days, not as it uh, currently is, and the cardiac networks uh, were able to deliver it. Uh, and NICE issued guidance and quality standards in 2013. So what happened? We, we recognized that a better treatment could be established if we were to centralize services and reconfigure services completely, but it, it, it had inherent uh, uh, challenges to the service. You'll see here on this slide uh, thrombolysis in blue and primary PCI in red dots. And if you go to the left of the slide, in 2003, uh, we had almost entirely a thrombolysis service. But by the time that NIAP reported in 2008 showing that it was feasible to deliver the service and then NHS improvement on the cardiac networks delivering, uh, by 2012 we got up to 95% of all heart attacks, all STEMI heart attacks being treated in this way, and we're now at 97%. Um, what I should have said in the last slide is that that was associated, associated with a change in 30-day mortality from about 12.5% down to just over 8%. Now, other things happen over the same length of time. It's not entirely due to primary PCI, but nevertheless, the, out, the outcome of all this was improved survival. And if you look at this slide, this simply shows the standardized mortality ratio for heart attacks over the last 20 years, which shows a dramatic reduction, uh, well, a dramatic improvement in survival from heart attacks. And importantly, what you uh, may be able to see in the sort of bottom line uh, there is that the gap between survival rates for those uh, who had the worst survival rates and, the and uh, those with the best survival rates has actually narrowed uh, considerably over the last 20 years. So what, uh, what's, still, uh, next, uh, what's still left to be done? Uh, well, for ST elevation myocardial infarction, we need to ensure that all centers are running 24 by 7 services. We need to ensure that the workforce uh, rotors are uh, not unreasonable. 60, about two-thirds of STEMI heart attacks occur outside normal working hours. And we need to continue to audit the pathway efficiency. I've not, started, I've not talked really about non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, and this is perhaps where we have more challenges, which is to improve the pathways of care so that more than 56% of patients get coronary angiography undertaken in, a, in an appropriate length of time. And for all myocardial infarction, we need to increase the availability of uh, cardiac rehabilitation. So those are our challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Huon. So I'm going to take questions for both Huon and, and for Tony after Tony's uh, presentation, simply because there will be a degree of commonality about understanding how you achieve this in a locality and perhaps what the barriers are. So Tony, can you talk about stroke for us? Thanks very much indeed, Keith. And the story really is very, very similar for stroke, um, except we're probably 10 years behind stroke. Um, those of you who are 
as old as I am or approaching it, will remember the time um, when perhaps 20 years ago, uh, stroke was regarded as being essentially an untreatable disease, a disease managed by general physicians. The very little happened to patients when they were admitted to hospital. The outcomes were terrible, probably the worst uh, in Europe. Um, things have changed very considerably over the last 20 years. It's now a disease which is looked after largely by specialists, but we're facing a potential threat to that, which is the pressure within hospitals managing stroke patients from general medicine and the um, huge increase um, in A&E activity that there is. And the, often the response to that is to um, lose some of the specialist element um, and try and get everybody being managed by generalists. And I think that threatens potentially to take us back down the road towards where we've actually come from. The rationale for centralizing hyperacute stroke care is really very strong, lots of evidence. Um, and we perhaps are not very good um, at evidence-based healthcare planning, and I think we need to get better at it. So we first of all know that patients do need to be admitted to a specialist unit. Diagnosing stroke, treating stroke, um, is not something which one would expect every single acute physician to be able to do. Um, we've got clot-busting treatment, just like um, the cardiologists have had, and we now have thrombectomy, and that's going to provide us with a very different sort of challenge um, over the next five years in terms of implementing it. And we also know that just like getting patients into coronary care units, getting them into stroke units saves lives and reduces disability. So those are things which I don't think we can compromise on. There are certain things we know about the way that services should be organized. We know that bigger services operate more efficiently and more effectively than small services. And you can take as an example of that, that the door to needle times for people um, needing thrombolysis um, are shorter in the bigger units. We know that outcomes are better in units where there is an adequate nurse, start, nurse ratio to bed ratio. Um, and we therefore need to focus our expertise in terms of nursing um, in those centers. We know that at the moment there are still major variations, and I'll show you a map on the next slide, um, in terms of the performance and the processes of care across the country, but also across the week. Um, and we published a paper in the, in the Lancet last year showing that there is big variation in terms of the quality of care that we're delivering, not just weekends, but at night times during the different days of the week depending upon which processes of care you look at. So we do need to eliminate those uh, variations and create genuine seven day, 24 hours a week, high quality services. The biggest threat that we face is from the shortage of stroke specialist consultants. We have difficulty recruiting them. We have difficulty um, in terms of getting junior doctors to decide to train in it. And 40% of all hospitals have a vacant post in stroke. Uh, and clearly, we do not have enough consultants around to staff at an adequate level uh, the 120-odd units in England that are currently uh, providing acute stroke care. And we've got really good quality uh, research data from London and Manchester from a study being done uh, by Naomi Fullop from University College London and others showing that actually the changes that have happened in Manchester and London have resulted in much better outcomes low mortality rate um, and, uh, in fact, cost savings if you're prepared to look beyond the first few days in terms of the cost of the health service. So on the left of this slide, you can see where we are now. These are data from the National Audit. Uh, red is bad, amber is not great, uh, and uh, dark green is, is a B, and what you're aiming for is pale green. And what you can see is that there are big geographical variations in terms of the quality of care that's being delivered from acute trusts. So London and Manchester are up in Northumbria and some parts of southwest England appear to be doing really quite well. But there are areas in the Midlands and the east and some parts of northern England where the quality of care clearly isn't great. And on the two graphs on the right-hand side of that slide, you can see the average performance across the country. And it's still not great. We're still only seeing about 60% of people getting to a stroke unit 
within four hours, one of the key elements to deliver high-quality care, and getting to see a stroke consultant within 24 hours, and obviously the target now is to make sure that we agree 14 hours, we're still not achieving that in every center. So what do we need to do? Well, I think we need to learn the lessons from reorganization in London and Manchester and Northumbria, which produced overnight improvements, literally, in the processes of care. In London, it's estimated that 98 lives are saved every year compared to the rest of the country as a result of the changes that were made there. Every area of the country has thought about how they might consider reorganizing care, and in most places, actually, it's perfectly clear which hospitals should be delivering care and which hospitals should be supporting those hospitals to deliver that care but ceasing to do it themselves. We need to make the decision that actually the services should be provided on the basis of what the patients need um, and not around the needs of the institutions, the hospitals and the clinicians, and make those changes, get those changes delivered now. Um, we are facing huge delays in terms of decision-making. Um, and it's not actually particularly about more resource, it's about the way that you organize the care, um, and in the long-term, centralization will produce savings. SDPs, I think, are in a good position to enable these things to happen, but unfortunately, at the moment, it's just not appearing. And I think every day's delay results in more people dying and more people surviving disabled than is necessary. Thank you. Tony, thank you. Who's seen a patient have a stroke? And to know that for some of those patients, speedy intervention in a specialist center will essentially completely reverse otherwise what is a life-changing, devastating disability to live with. It's quite difficult to understand that and why we haven't moved when you see that map of the country with those ambers and reds. So there's something in here about the politics, there's something in here about the public, there's something in here about the professions. Tony, just to give us an idea on the stroke, well, and please think of questions uh, to raise straight after I've asked my questions, but Tony, just give an idea for those who are not clinicians in the room, what it means, what you need to have a thrombectomy undertaken. What does it look like? To deliver thrombectomy, um, that is where you're putting a catheter into the groin, it threads it up through the heart, into the carotid artery, into the brain, you release a little um, net that pulls the blood clot out. Um, and literally, it can be transforming. People who operate in that field describe patients who come in who are unable to speak, completely paralyzed down the right-hand side, threatening to have an absolutely huge stroke, who more or less walk off the table and are able to go home the following day. Uh, and the first patient treated at St. George's when they set up a 24-hour service there was an 18-year-old girl, and it hit the press. And this was a girl who was heading to having a huge stroke, who is now normal. Um, and not only in terms of the the effects on that young person, uh, but on their families and on the cost of the health service, that is a huge benefit, being able to deliver that treatment. So we need to have services which can very rapidly assess a patient when they come into hospital. They can get a brain scan, including an angiogram, and every hospital now has the capacity to do that if they uh, were, you know, wanted to. They need to be able to interpret those scans. They need to be able to get them to a center where that is available. Um, and, you know, it's not rocket science to show that actually those centers need to be ready and available to deliver that care 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They need to be staffed by people who know what they're doing and are maintaining enough experience to be able to do that treatment, uh, to be able to do it safely and high quality care all the time. Please raise your hand if you have questions in the audience that might relate specifically to this. While you're thinking of those, Huon, what do you think the barriers are for you? What's the sort of commissioning architecture around this, and is that in the way? Um, yes, uh, it gets down to the rather fine uh, detail that's of interest to, to some and uh, not to many people, but ST elevation myocardial infarction is commissioned by NHS England directly through its specialised commissioning uh, group. 
uh, whereas non-ST elevation myocardial infarction is commissioned by CCGs. Now, although the, the pathways of care are very similar, they're not quite the same, but they're very similar, the pathophysiology is almost identical. In other words, it's essentially one condition. But to have commissioning by two very different routes hasn't been particularly helpful. I think we could uh, do better if they were commissioned singly by either NHS England or by um, CCGs. Questions from the floor? Any hands up in the far side? Thank you. Could you say who you are, please? Yeah, Dominic Slurry, National Clinical Advisor for Learning Disability and Premature Mortality. Uh, so we know that people with learning disability die 15 to 20 years sooner than the rest of the population. And we know that stroke and heart attacks are, are two of the biggest causes of that premature mortality. So the question is, are there or can there be any targeted approaches to, to groups that are, are particularly more vulnerable or even less likely to access the, these you know, stunning results and stunning services that have been put in place? Point of view, from the point of view of um, ST elevation myocardial infarction, as you'll know perfectly well, the diagnosis is quite easy to make at the patient's bedside. It requires an ECG. Now, as long as an ECG is undertaken on anyone from a potentially deprived group, then the treatment pathway is exactly the same, and there's good evidence to show that there is no group that is disadvantaged. They do go through the same pathway, and the outcomes are just the, the same. So for ST elevation uh, infarction, I wouldn't expect those with a learning disability to be disadvantaged. Those with non-ST elevation myocardial infarction tend to be admitted to a local hospital. And there, I think, there is the potential for pathways to be slower or quicker, um, depending on a whole variety of circumstances. So my answer to your question would be, for non-ST elevation, yes, there is the potential for us to be able to do better. But it's not just those with learning disability. It will be those with serious mental illnesses and, and other others, uh, challenged groups. And I think the, the, the yep. story for stroke is very similar. I think there may well be an issue around slower response to stroke when people have those, when they have a stroke um, in the community, particularly if they're living in institutions. I mean, I don't know exactly the data for people with learning disabilities. What I know is that if you have a, a stroke in any sort of institution, a nursing home or even a hospital, actually the, the time from the onset of the disease to recognition and correct response is often much, much slower. And I think whether that's prejudice or whether it's a belief that it, you know, it's less important, I think we need to uh, sort out. Thank you. A question here. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeremy Vane's the chair at the Royal Wolverhampton Hospital. It, it's a stroke question and we're very pleased there's a public consultation in Walsall at the moment to try to bring together uh, repatriate the, the Warsaw um, cohort of stroke patients to a, an enlarged um, unit at Wolverhampton. One point that seems to be um, an issue is the tariff isn't sympathetic enough, perhaps, to phase the rehab phase of the stroke recovery pathway back at the more local hospital. And therefore, I can see great reasons to centralise people at the hyper centre to get the early part of the pathway much better improved. But if the tariff means uh, it's, it's difficult to move people back again, they're going to have a longer, slower, more adverse experience for the patient and their family coming a longer distance to see them. And I think if that could be eased a bit, it may enable um, the, you know, the whole system to, to gain rather than a, a perception that certain centres grab everything and then keep everything. It seems sad that the tariff gets in the way of doing the right thing all the way through the pathway. I don't think it needs to be. Um, certainly in London, part of the plans around reconfiguring services there from 32 hospitals just down to eight delivering the hyperacute care and a further 16 is doing acute stroke care. A lot of the discussions was around how the tariff would be split between the organizations. Uh, the, the pathway for most stroke patients should be they come into a hyperacute unit. If they still need hospital care after 72 hours, they go into an acute stroke unit and in my view should stay there for the rest of their inpatient stay apart from a very small number who may need to go on to specialist rehab. Um, and it is not difficult to split that tariff. Um, 
between those two organizations. It's been done in several parts of the country. Um, there are issues around parts of the country that use long periods of hospital in rehabilitation hospitals separate from the, the stroke thing, but that isn't the model which I would be pushing you to be developing. And I think there's something in there, isn't there, about um, there's no reason why we can't do this collectively and networks should be about drawing patients into the for the specialist event but also the networks have a real opportunity to draw patients out again because that's some of the professional and, and institutional issues that go with it and those things can be can be dealt with final question on this section if I may uh, thank you uh, my name is Dan Duggan from North England Commission support uh, what struck me is both presentations were very very compelling now, this should just be happening, we should be doing it. So I guess the question is quite simply, why, why aren't we? Why isn't the pace there? And what's your confidence level that if we're sitting here in 12 months or 24 months, the map would be all the nice pale green colour rather than red and amber? Yeah. I mean, I, I, it is incredibly frustrating seeing what needs to be done, realising that it's not that complex to achieve it. We need to have really strong muscular commissioning, I think, from the STPs and the CCGs. We need to have them beginning to believe that actually they're not being employed or being, you know, the hospitals have to be prepared to change um, and to uh, respond to a new environment. We need politicians to stop making fusses about their local hospital no longer necessarily delivering every single component of care. And I think we also um, need to have a, an ability really to be, yeah, to, be, to be much more muscular in terms of the way that we do it. I think that the, the, there is an element of, real, of bureaucracy within the health service. If you want to change things, it becomes an incredibly complex process. And I think within the NHS, we need to look and see how we... Uh, um, whether all those processes are really necessary, if they really need to take all that time that they seem to be taking currently. Here on final comment. Just, just, just one comment from um, uh, my experience of the heart attack uh, uh, changes. You may have noticed from the graph that I showed that actually whilst we were going through the process of trying to work out the feasibility of rolling out primary PCI nationally, the numbers that were actually increasing already. Now, that, that I, to my mind, is being driven by clinical drive. It's people who are really wanting, it's the clinical leadership. But then the next phase of getting from the initial clinical leaders through to 100% coverage, that was actually achieved because of the works of the cardiac networks as they existed. Now, whether the STPs can be the, the same or whether the urgent and emergency care networks can be the same vehicles as the old cardiac networks were, I don't know, but you do need that sort of uh, collaborative approach to, to make the change really happen. Thank you very much. I'm going to move us on now to the major incidents uh, of the recent past. Chris Moran has led the, as I said, the debriefs, the clinical debriefs on all of those, some very close after the events and then some further down the line. A lot of lessons. Many of us will not experience having to respond to one of these events, but all of us, I'm sure, when they're happening, just think, what would it be like if we had to? What are the lessons that have been learned? We've got better with every single one, but if it was my hospital, my community, my profession, what should I know? So I'm going to ask Chris now just to talk through the events and give you some idea of what came out of that and the lessons that were learned. Thank you. Thanks. So good, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Chris Moran. I've got lots of fancy titles, but actually I'm a frontline clinician. I'm a full-time trauma surgeon, putting broken people back together. I was on call this weekend, that meant I spent 24 hours in the operating theatre operating on trauma patients. We've had a fairly difficult six months in the NHS dealing with these events. I'm going to focus today not on the clinical lessons that we've learnt, because we've learnt plenty, but actually on the managerial system levels, what it's like to be gold command when it hits the fan.
And I'd like you to listen, because last week I gave a similar talk down in London with the Metropolitan Police Commissioner. And she was absolutely crystal clear. There will be another attack. For the security services and the police, the real game changer was the Mumbai attack in November 20, 2008, the first marauding terrorist firearms attack. It completely changed how our emergency services, our police and security services, were going to respond to a terrorist attack. But in England at that time, we didn't have our major trauma networks. And from a clinical perspective for the networks, the real game changer was the Paris attack, including the terrible event at the Bataclan Theatre. Within eight days, we had a clinical summit of all of the major trauma centres in, in the country, all of the networks, and sat down and brainstormed how we would manage such an event in this country. And from that came some principles that sadly we've had to put into place over the first six months of this year with our series of attacks. March the 22nd, 2017, many of you will remember where you were. The remarkable thing about this event was how quick it took. The whole thing lasted just 83 seconds. Medically, we were faced with three serious types of patients. Those who were directly injured in the attack. It's worth remembering that most people who get hit by a car get by a hit by a car that's decelerating because the driver is braking. In these events, we're seeing terrible acts, terrible injuries because the car is accelerating into the pedestrians. We had a gunshot wound and a knifing, and then one patient in the river the type of trauma we normally see. There was then a second wave of injuries from the three in clouds. People just tripping and breaking an ankle, people having an asthma attack or an angina attack. And then, peculiar to this, for the first time ever, we saw a third wave of injuries. And that's because the police now tell people to run, hide and tell. And patients hid for two, three, four hours and then came out later. So we saw a wave of casualties coming to the hospitals a little bit later than we've seen in previous events. What went well in Westminster? Well, there was an incredibly rapid response, as you've seen. There was also a fantastic Samaritan response from NHS staff who were either on duty in St. Thomas's or just walking along, helping people. We got the right patients to the right hospital as quickly as possible. So our triage and on-scene casualty distribution worked extremely well. Patients received unquestionably a fantastic standard of clinical care. And we started a system of early system debriefs to try and learn so that we could put things in place for the next time it happened. What did we learn? Well, this is an important one if you're the commander. You are going to be frustrated because at the beginning you will not have enough information. It's better that you know that's going to happen. You can prepare for it. You will be frustrated. You won't quite know what's happening. The ambulance service didn't know what happened initially. So early information is always poor. We had difficulties with communication from the scene to the hospitals. And there was no hospital ambulance liaison officers. This is paramedics going to, who went and stayed in the casualty department to talk by walkie-talkie or radio to the teams on scene to say what was coming. There was remarkably a lot of confusion about how you go about declaring a major incident. Not surprising because most clinicians, most managers will never do it in their lives. But we need to be clear about how, what's the mechanics of a hospital declaring a major incident. And then we also discovered some issues around hospital security, and I'll come back to those later. 
One mile from here, just six weeks later, was the second major attack. Once again, it was remarkable how quick the system responded. Ten minutes to get the first paramedic on scene, a major incident declared just four minutes later, and a command structure in place within 20 minutes of the bomb going off. One of the most interesting lessons for me from this event was that parents are superhuman. A parent can snatch up and run with a teenager in their arms. And that, for us, created an unanticipated problem, because the first ambulances going to the scene met parents carrying their children, flagging them down. What do you do if you're the paramedic? You stop, of course. The problem that created, the issue, unavoidably, was actually the more serious injured were still at the scene. And the command and control problem was that patients were arriving at hospital even earlier than anticipated, and nobody could quite keep up with the numbers, because people were coming in unexpected ways and earlier than we thought. The media played a huge event in every one of the attacks, played a huge part. And there are many, many benefits. One of which is that the teams now, the clinical teams and the managerial teams, get a very early alert that something's up on Twitter or Facebook. And people respond quickly and put themselves onto what is a major incident standby, not an official place, but something that's happened in reality in every single case. Twitter and Facebook and media outlets provide real-time information which the clinicians at scene and the Gold Command are using to try and work out what's going on. You're able to anticipate the type of injuries you'll be dealing with, prepare your casualty department and your operating theatres at a much earlier stage. So there are huge, huge positives from the change and the improvement in media communications. In each event, the clinical teams and the managerial teams reported that rapidly setting up WhatsApp groups was incredibly beneficial for team communication. The key, of course, is that on WhatsApp, you should not use clinically identifiable information, but it is pretty secure, and it has been very effective. There are also some downsides with the media that we need to recognize and anticipate for the future. Firstly, it will be intrusive. Hospital staff, hospital managers are not used to a flood of international media. Managing the media on your hospital site becomes quite a big task for the gold commander and their silver commander. Secondly, one of the real problems with social media is that information spreads quickly, but so does misinformation. So an example in the, London, in the Manchester bombing was a misinformation that there was a gunman running in the hospital, shooting people. Now, you can imagine being in the A&E department resuscitating the kids who've been blasted, and then you think that behind you there's a gunman coming. So misinformation is a real problem and very difficult to control. The media will want to talk to the patients, to the staff, and sometimes it's the wrong time for them psychologically to talk. We've never had any guidance before on what staff or patients should do in this situation, but NHS England, after the events, we had common theme each time, has now put together an information leaflet, which is just about complete, which will go to staff members, giving them advice on what to do. Not saying don't talk to the media, but saying just think about what it's going to mean to you, because you suddenly may become inadvertently the centre of a media firestorm. VIP visits, again, as Gold Commander, they put a lot of pressure on your hospital. They're very important, very important people, but 
it will impact your hospital. And the best advice we can do, give is that right from the beginning, you need to assign a couple of managers to manage the VIP visits alone. Because if you don't, it will start to impact on the clinical care of the patients and also your managerial system. And then finally, it did happen. It's unbelievable, but it did happen after Manchester. The teenagers who were damaged and badly injured and their families had some terrible things happen. I don't know how we can stop this, but what we can do again is try and provide advice targeted more at the younger generation because they're the people who get more affected by this to try and help them to understand what's happening when they become suddenly the center of attention. We learned some things about command and control of the hospital. Three important don'ts. So number one, if you're the gold commander, do not be attempted, tempted to declare the incident over too early. Site cleared means that your casualty department, your A&E, is incredibly busy. A&E cleared means that your operating theatres are running full steam. Operating theatres cleared means that your critical care units are running full steam as patients go through the system. So don't be tempted to declare it's over too soon. The second thing is that everybody focuses on day one as patients come through the door, but actually these patients create a massive workload. In Manchester, 400 hours of surgery took place in the next week. 400 hours. The incident takes place, it is over in a second, but the impact on the hospital goes on for many, many days, and in many cases, many, many weeks. So don't underestimate the workload. And likewise, based on that, do not attempt to go back to business as usual too early. You will have to delay some elective cases. Your plastic and orthopedic surgeons are going to be really busy for a week. We need to think about using the networks better. Can we divert patients to a mother major trauma center to relieve the pressure on the centers that have taken most of the patients? So I think there are things that we can all do to help. And finally, please don't forget your staff. They have had a hard time, not just a hard night. But interestingly, a thing that we've really learned is that one of the staff groups really affected are those who are either not on duty or those who get turned away because actually you've got enough numbers. They sort of feel like second-class citizens, but they do a really important job because they need to take over the next morning when the team have been operating all night or have been in casualty all night, have to go to bed. So we need to think better about how we manage that group of patients, because that group of staff, because they universally did feel like second-class citizens, but actually it's how we as a whole develop, provide the care for all of the patients. Just when we thought it was over, it just continued. Likewise, the London Bridge attack was over incredibly quickly, and it is just remarkable that the terrorists were neutralized just within 18 minutes of starting the attack. They'd learned some important lessons from Westminster. And one of the things that we need to appreciate, if, if we look at the Middle East, where some of the terrorists will train, is that hospitals are a potential target. And that means that we, in, as in charge of the system, need to ensure that our hospitals can be locked down for security. There will be armed police outside the door. Your staff must know, you must make sure they know where their safe entry points are. And you must emphasize, as a rather well-known orthopedic surgeon in London discovered, that if you don't turn up with your ID badge, it doesn't matter who you are. PC Plod, with his bloody great gun, will not let you in the hospital. 
So we have to make sure our staff know their roles in a major incident. And then the other thing, again, learned from the Middle East is that when the patients come in, you're not quite sure who they are, you're not sure if it's a terrorist or not, and you don't know what they're carrying. So you have to have systems in place between the police and yourselves of making sure you know who are the potential bad guys. And I'm going to finish. For a blood and gut surgeon like me, talking about what I think is actually the most important lessons of all we've learned from these events. And that is, although we can do a huge amount to help physical recovery, we don't do anything like enough to help people through the psychosocial effects of these incidents. We do know that counselling at an early stage is harmful, but there is also really good evidence that psychological first aid is very, very effective. And NHS England has done a lot of work on this over the last six months to try and improve things. We need to normalise it. It's, if you're upset by this, it's normal. Everybody is upset by this. People are remarkably resilient. That's the thing I've really learnt over the last year, few years. And that the most important way of debriefing psychologically is actually talking to your family, talking to your mates, talking to your colleagues who have experienced the same thing. And we need to try and encourage that. And the really, really important that NHS institutions realise that we need to provide this psychosocial care, psychological support for the staff, as well as the patients, as well as the relatives. Finally, what I think is going to be the biggest change for emergency preparations occurred in Manchester. When we plan for dealing with a major incident, we plan for it a bit like it's going to be Hiroshima. Thousands of people dead, nothing we can do to help the dead. They're dead. But the people we don't plan for are the bereaved relatives of the victims. Those bereaved relatives are not going to come under surgical services, but every GP in here knows what it's like to deal with a bereaved family. Everybody knows the heartbreak of losing a family member. The Manchester Bereavement Service was an absolute first. It was the first time that the Bereavement Service had ever been involved in a major incident. The police, the coroner for Manchester, and the NHS worked together to provide a service for the families. The families were all put up in a single hotel in Manchester. They were assigned a one-to-one -one bereavement nurse 24 hours a day for the next three days, a crutch to help them. They were given GP support because you're 150 miles from home, you've not got your tablets, you're feeling terrible, you've got a migraine. They need general practice support, so they provided general practice support so the nitty-gritty, silly little things that become magnified when you're deeply upset could be helped and dealt with. Most importantly, they were incredibly honest with the families. When there was virtually no hope, they were honest. They were never pretending that they thought that their loved ones had survived. They were clear with them and honest from them right from the beginning. Rather than having a cold forensic mortuary to go and view their loved ones, they turned the mortuary into a ward like a hospital ward, a nice environment where they could go and see their sons or their daughters or their brothers or sisters. And then they left them with memories of them, memories to treasure for the future rather than the horror of what they've been through. And I think that this is something that we need to seriously think about in the NHS, adopting throughout the country, because traumatic death is traumatic death. It doesn't just require a mass incident. Suicide is a terrible event for a family. A road traffic accident is a terrible event for a family. We can do a huge amount more to help families cope with that ex experience. <laughs>
So in conclusions, ladies and gentlemen, we have had a very, very busy first half of the year in the NHS, dealing with this series of events. But we owe it to these. These are some of the young kids who died just a mile away from here. We owe it that their deaths have not been in vain, that we learn from their deaths to make the system better. Nothing could have prevented these, these kids' deaths, but next time we don't know what we face and we can make it better and we can improve the system. And a final and really important message. The teams in Manchester and London did an absolutely fantastic job. Thank you. I don't think it's appropriate to have questions after that. I think we've all been left with some profound thoughts and ideas. If you do have specific questions about some of the detail of that, some of the operational side of it, things like the bereavement service, which were just remarkable and outstanding, then Chris will be available afterwards to talk to.